NC Baptist, our brothers and sisters in the western part of the state, they're suffering and they need our help. The aftermath of Hurricane Helene has caused unprecedented devastation and destruction. Many are still missing, homes are destroyed, and lives have simply been changed forever. North Carolina Baptists, you have been responding. We already have five locations set up over the affected areas. In fact, we can do over 35,000 meals that are being served every single day. North Carolina Baptists have been responding with hundreds of volunteers deploying in counties all across the affected parts of Western North Carolina. And so many of you have asked, what can I do to help? Well, you can pray, you can give, and you can prepare to go. Pray, give, and go. Number one, you can pray. This morning, we spoke with one of our board members from Bakersfield, which is close to Spruce Pine, one of the hardest hit areas. And she asked for prayer for their emotional well being and for wisdom for just simply moving forward. It's prayer requests like these that we keep hearing hourly because so many who have been impacted don't know what to do. They're in complete shock and the next step is simply hard. Would you pray that the peace of our loving God would wash over Western North Carolina? Many people are without power, water, cell phone signal. Friends, now is the time for us to be the church and unite together before the throne room of grace to ask our great God for his healing and his comfort. Prayer is always our primary strategy, never our last resort. And you can visit ncbaptist.org forward slash Helene and submit your prayer request. We will collect those and we will share those with others that we can all join in praying together. Number two, you can give. You can give to the North Carolina Missions Offering. It's givencmo.com and just give a donation to the North Carolina Missions Offering. NC Baptist on Mission, their entire budget for the whole year and all they're doing in these response efforts comes from the generosity of people like you. You can also give by collecting items through your local church. Items like baby care products, uh, um, diapers and wipes, personal hygiene items, cleaning supplies, bottled water, canned foods, tarps, and all, so much more. You can collect those. And third, you can go. The need is great now and for the foreseeable future. We don't know completely the full extent of the needs that exist because many are still missing. The, the floodwaters, they're, they're still covering up many of the areas and while we're deploying the most skilled disaster response professionals, we need volunteers like you who can respond now and for the months to come. Listen, we're in day three, but we're working for week three, for month three, and even the next three years. NC Baptist, this is a life-changing, state-changing disaster that the people of God must respond on mission together. Visit ncbaptist.org forward slash Aline and add your name to the list of those who wanna be on mission together. This is one of those times that we all need to step up and do whatever it takes. North Carolina Baptist, are you with us? Please pray, give, and go. Visit ncbaptist.org forward slash Shaleen to learn more, and let's be on mission together. If you have your Bibles, by the way, you can go ahead and, and uh, be turning over to Job. Uh, Job, we're looking at a few places in Job uh, today. I, uh, we were in, we, and we still are in the, we were doing a series in Ruth. And with all of the events that have happened over the last, this past week, and where things have, have been, I just feel like it's important to address something. And that's this, because we've had tragedy strike, we've had calamity strike, not, not just in Florida, but in, jo uh, in Georgia, in, uh, in the mountains of, of West North Carolina, in Asheville, all the surrounding areas. Uh, we've seen a, a deluge uh, come down of rain uh, coming off of Mount Mitchell and created some problems that we uh, could, could not have imagined. And uh, many people have been impacted. We're still in the process of recovery now, looking to help people. 
And I thought, we need to address this. And you may, may wonder, so what do we do when tragedy strikes? As believers uh, uh, in Christ, there is a way that we are to respond that's different than the world. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, when we look at what's happening, uh, the way the world responds, and maybe the way that the church or believers respond. And I want to look at that for a minute. So what do we do when, when tragedy strikes, and how do we make sense out of senseless tragedy, and how should we respond to that, what I consider to be this such senseless tragedy? So that's where, where we are today. Why? And how do we make sense of the senseless? If we could, let's have a word of prayer. And uh, as we begin this, this message today, Father, would you guide every word that is said? Lord, would you help Lord, us to learn something, maybe take, a, take away something that we needed to know or that we need to do or some action that we need to take? And Father, get me out of the way this morning so that these, your people, will hear whatever it is you want them to hear. I, I, my opinions will get us in trouble, so just help me to stick between the lines of what you want to be taught today, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Common phrase we hear a lot. Now, in, in, being, in spending time in law enforcement, you see a lot. You, you see a lot of, of things, and, and it does make you, it begs the question of why would God allow this? Whether it be a child that's in a house that is abused, whether it be a senseless, senseless killing, a loss of human life, what about natural disasters? How, how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of truly what looks like the senseless? And in turn, how do we endure how do we in, in talking about enduring through the storm how do we endure through this and how do we make sense of this there's a lot of people that are in the western part of the state now that uh in florida and georgia and it's even south carolina that are trying to just survive right now and and they don't have to have time to even think about the making sense out of this they just they're trying to make it they're trying to survive they're trying to recover lost loved ones but it begs the question, why would God allow this? So the question for us is, how do we endure such storms? How do we do this? And, how, and, and, and so here we are at a point in this, this crisis and this, all that's going on in the state where we begin to think, how do we respond? What do we do? And I wanted to go, of all places, to the book of Job. Because I thought, you know what, no one knows better than Job about loss of everything. Losing everything from his wealth to his family to his livelihood. Everything's gone in an instant. And I thought, let's, let's look at that for a moment. If, if you look in Job uh, in chapter 1, the area of chapter 1, the setup to this is that there are very few places, if not just this one, where we see behind the curtain of heaven at some of the interaction between Satan and God. We see maybe some of this interaction of how they talk to each other and that you see how uh, corrupt and deceitful and sinful Satan is and, and about his motives, but you see in this this. Uh, scenario you see a little bit about the mind of God and God is uh, Satan is questioning uh, God saying you know what the only reason certain people serve you is because you give them stuff <laughs> you know you get they give you you give them stuff and of course they're gonna say oh give me give me give me we love you it's just like being a parent <laughs> it's a and you think you think that way, but then Satan's saying that's really why they serve you. They don't serve you because they love you. And that leads to the question that, that God says, which is, hey, have you, ever, have you heard of Job? Have you heard of Job? God allows for Job to be tested. 
in, in a way that is unimaginable. You, you see that he's going to lose everything and he's going to literally get to the place where he has nothing left. And let's see what happens when he has nothing left. In chapter 1, uh, ver chapter one verse 13, it says, there was a, Now there was a day when his Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and, and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkey feeding beside them, and the, and the Sabians fell upon them, and they took them, and they struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And the Sabians fell upon them, and took them, and struck down the servants of, of the, by the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another, and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and, and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed these groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell. Now all of this information is coming to Job suddenly. He said, and if that's not enough, he says, while, while he was yet speaking, there came another and he said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people and they, they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Such tragedy, by the way, that you see how this is setting up. All of this is happening to Job. All of these things, this, these tragic things are happening. One after the other are befalling him. The calamity is happening in his house. It's enough to have one thing, a loss of a loved one or something, but Job's having everything happen at once. <laughs> and you might say that this is tragic. But God was not the one who allowed it all. <laughs> he didn't allow all this suffering and tragedy to fall upon Job. <laughs> really? Because according to verse 12, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Talking about what Job has. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So he can't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he was given carte blanche to do anything to Job but kill him. Didn't say he couldn't kill somebody else, which he did, but he couldn't touch Job. See, um, this is hard to digest, by the way. I, I don't know about, about you, but our human nature and our human side, this ought to, this ought to be unsettling to you. I'm not saying that God is not sovereign and God, that we do not go and we, we do whatever God's will is and we're at His beckoning and we're here in this life to glorify God, okay? I'm not questioning that. But I'm saying a lot of this is hard to, to process as human beings. I hope it is, unless you're a serial killer. I hope this is hard for you to kind of just, just to, to understand or for it to settle in on. I can think of times where I've seen things and, and it's really hard for me to process. It, it's easy for me to use the phrase, why would a loving God? allow some things in this life I, I and the answer I, i'm not going to have you leave today thinking man i got this all figured out thank you pastor <laughs> it's not going to happen you're still going to have some questions and that's okay to ask questions because we see in this story we see already in the story that god not only allowed it 
but he invited Satan to cause tragedy in the life of Job to show Satan the faith and the loyalty of his follower. He allowed it. God allowed for suffering to come into the life of Job. I don't know, maybe some of this hits home. Maybe you, I don't know what things you've experienced in your life, but maybe you've experienced some things sometimes and you're you're thinking, how do I make sense of this? Some of the things and the suffering, and whether it be physical suffering or loss, how do you make sense of it? And sometimes it can beg the question. And by the way, it is okay to ask this question. It's okay to ask it because it, you may have asked it more, more than once. Why? Why? Why, God? Haven't you? Have you ever just... Just had a, a good old why time with God where you're just really wanting to make sense of what's happening. Why you see this tragedy? Why, why you see these things happening? And because right now, at this point in time in the world, our world is in chaos. Whether it be uh, the hurricane uh, in the western part of our state or other states or in Florida whether it be wars in the Middle East right now, which the, the, the Middle East is in total chaos, whether it be in Russia, where Russia has invaded uh, the, the Ukraine, there, are, there is chaos in all parts of the world right now. We have Iran now becoming involved, which they always were involved in the Israeli conflict. And, but you see all of these things in play, and you're thinking, there is, where's the answer? To how to get through this? How do, how does the world come to some sort of detente? How do we come to, to come to grips with all of this chaos and hurting and suffering in the world? My answer is, I can't fix it, and you can't fix it, and God alone is going to be the one that be, that brings order to this. But here's what God needs from you. Yes, he does need something from you. He needs your loyalty. He needs your faithfulness. He needs your commitment to him. That's all he needs. That's all he, that's all he desires of you. He wants you to serve and love him with your whole heart. 2021 20, of Job says, Then Job arose. He tore his robe And he shaved his head, and he fell on the ground, and he said, why? No, he didn't do that, did he? I I still don't completely understand how he did this. I don't. But when all of this had happened to him, this calamity came, he fell to the ground, and he worshipped. He gave God glory. He gave God his, the glory that he alone deserves. And he worshipped. And he said that saying that we've heard before. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked shall I return. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't get it. I don't understand how Job in this place that he is in and what has happened to him. Because by the way, he doesn't know this conversation between Satan and God. He doesn't know what they were talking about. He doesn't understand that. But, he, he, but all he knows to do is to, at the lowest point in his life, where he has nothing left but he and his wife, he bows down, he worships. He's grieved. I mean, he's hurting right now, desperately hurting, but he worships. Hmm. 
in 22 even, I, this, it's amazing that Job does this, but he, he, it, he makes the point to say in all this, Job did not sin, he did not sin, or charge God with wrong. He, he, he did not get, he did not start to have a, he didn't have a pity party for himself. He didn't begin to get angry with God, which is sometimes where our circumstance can lead us, can lead us it can lead us to some extreme anger and frustration. It can, it can lead us to, to, to do profane things. But Job says, I'm not going to charge God with anything. I'm simply going to serve him. No one around him even understood why he was acting this way. In fact, the biggest thing for the people that surrounded him, you know what they were? They kept asking him, what did you do wrong? <laughs> what did you do wrong? You had to do something for God to do this to you. And I'm here to say this. Praise God that he does not punish us based upon what we have done wrong. Nor does he reward us for what we've done right. God is faithful throughout all circumstances in our life. He's there regardless. This brings me to, to a verse that without the proper context can, seem, can make someone who is skeptical and cynical very mad. But in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, Verse 2 through 4. It's, it says, and it, it gets to how we respond and how God wants us to respond to those times in our life. <laughs> he, he literally says, To count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. I've actually gotten really mad at God for this when I read this. At right, and I remember, I still remember to this day, right after I lost my father. And uh, I'm sitting here and I'm reading and, and I see this verse and it just makes me more and more angry. Because I'm thinking, God, you want me to celebrate the fact that you took my dad from me. You really want me to celebrate that? You want me to celebrate the fact that I really was looking forward to... A lot of time with my dad, he just retired and he was, I was ready to have some wonderful one-on-one -on -one time with him. And at the young age of 68, God decides to take him. And I was mad. And when I saw a verse like this that said to count it all joy when you have various trials, it, it made no sense to me. It made none whatsoever. But that same verse, by the way, goes on to say this. That the reason for these various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And what it, when it says this, I want to clarify some, the way that it says this. It doesn't mean that when you go through trials that God's going to make you perfect. <laughs> no. Uh, the be better word to use de by definition would be refine. He's going to refine you. Refining hurts. Chipping away at the stuff in your life that doesn't need to be there. Whatever the case is, it hurts. Becoming someone transform transformative and new hurts. And it says here that this, this refining process is going to create something in you. It's going to make you a better person. It's going to make you more of what God wants you to be. And it's, it says here that you'll get to the point in that perfecting that you won't be lacking anything, that you'll know where to go to when those harder times come into your life. So you, God can work through even the toughest times of your life. He can refine you to where when times get hard, you know who to go to. So what does God have to say about all this? What, what does he say and how does he address this? And, and I want to look at uh, some uh, Job chapter 38 because I think, once again, my opinions get us in trouble. God's word, it's, it's what you need to hear. 
And it may not necessarily be what you like to hear. But God responds to Job because there is a time where Job has an interaction with God and he, he does say, God, I don't understand. I trust you, not leaving you, not, gonna, got, not going to become unfaithful to you, but I don't get it and I don't understand why I'm going through this. God's going to help Job understand his circumstances, but he's also going to show Job who he is, who God is. And, and I think we do need to have a better understanding of who God is in order to get through circumstances in our life. Maybe we need to understand that in, in some ways it's not all about you. Isn't that important? It's not all about you. Chapter 38, verse, starting with verse 4 through 7, it says this. And this is God responding to Job and, and saying, talking to Job. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. I love it. God can be sarcastic. <laughs> Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang? And by the way, the morning stars, when the angels sang uh, together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Is this prophecy fulfilled, or is God judging us? I mean, according to the Bible, the sign of Jesus' coming will be the appearance of many leaders claiming to be the Messiah or Christ and deceiving people. Jesus also said that people should not be alarmed by wars, rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, as these are routine events that do not indicate the end of the world. So God, we, we've, we've maintained that God is sovereign. God knows, God sees, He's God. But in prophecy... Is, is there something we should be looking toward that, that, that this, what we're seeing, the calamities of this day and age, should we look at them from the perspective of prophecy? And, and I wanted to, to share a couple of, uh, just a verse with you about that, a couple of verses, that in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, because I, I do think it's important as we see so much happening in the world right now, the calamity, the all of these things, what, what does it mean? Is there something we should look for? And Jesus answers this as he's being asked about this. What will be the signs of your coming? And it says that as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Because a lot of people are <laughs> looking at things and sometimes they can conclude something and they can get scared. But Jesus answered them and said, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And, and they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars. Huh. And rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, but this must take place but the end is not yet it says for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places and all of these things are but the beginning the beginning of the birth pain I don't know when God, when Christ is coming again. I don't know. I can always say soon, it'll be sooner than it ever was, and that can obviously be a very true statement. But I don't know. I can't tell you. I not, we're not here to throw dates out or anything else, but I'm here to say this, that all of the things that we see are simply symptoms or signs that lead toward the coming of Christ. But it says that all that we're seeing is only the beginning. This leads us to another question. Because we've talked a 
talked, we've talked a lot about what God does. Why would a loving God? Why does God allow this stuff? We've seen what happens in the life of Job. But what is our action and how should we respond to these cataclysmic events? What should be our response to Hurricane Helene and all the tragedy and the devastation caused by, the, by this, for this catastrophe? James chapter 1 verse 26, I think, spells a very simple message that I, I believe is, is relevant when it says that pure and lasting religion in the sight of God, our Father, means that we must care for orphans and widows in their troubles and refuse to let the world corrupt us. We're called to action to minister to those who are hurting. In this particular case, God, uh, get the, both orphans and widows are addressed, but there are many people that are hurting in this world. And we as Christians are called, and even in Acts, the early church all talked about how they bought and sold as they had need, and they made sure that people's needs were taken care of. We as the church have a responsibility to reach out to those and to help those and to minister to those. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, that is your call and that is your charge. You are here to, to give and to be a part of something way greater than yourself. And you're here to glorify God. It's true. There are many times that you're not going to understand why God allows crazy things like this to happen. But it doesn't change what your response should be. In closing today, first of all, I want to say some of this may not have made a whole lot of sense to you if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe, maybe there's something in your life lacking and you need to, to take an action. Maybe, maybe even today, maybe there's something in you saying, I need, to, I need to do so. I feel like I need to do something. Maybe the Holy Spirit's working on you. You're always, I would love to share with you and talk to you about how you can come to know Christ have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and if God's calling you in that direction I, I encourage you listen to that voice that still small voice but today maybe you're one who just needs to know how are you supposed to respond to all that we've seen in these recent these re this recent week this past week so in closing today I, what I would like to do is I would like to share a video with you before and, and after the video finishes uh, I want the altar is open this morning maybe you want to come and you want to just pray maybe you want to to commit something in your life to what God wants you to do maybe maybe you've been called to action to serve uh, and to help and we we have ways for you to do that through NC Baptist we have ways that you can be a part of what's happening with your gifts and talents uh, in the mountains now but whatever you do, I'm just encouraging you today. I hope that you walk away today a little bit more informed, but also I, you know, a little changed about maybe your perspective on what God is doing and what God is allowing. Let's continue to pray for those who are hurting and need prayer. Most of all, pray, pray, pray. Do not cease to pray today. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would be with this time. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, speak to our hearts in a way that only you can. And Lord, I pray that we would be stirred to action. We would be stirred to want to be a part of something greater than ourselves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are responding in a big way. This is one of our large feeding units, capable of providing 30,000 hot meals per day. To support that feeding effort, along with shower and laundry units, we have our tanker unit providing clean water. We also have chaplains working with survivors and our assessment teams. Recovery may be one of the biggest needs. Recovery crews are tarping roofs and removing trees down by the hurricane. We are here to help hurting people. 
and there are many opportunities to do that. People are in a desperate situation, and as North Carolina Baptists, we are offering help and hope in Jesus' name. Please continue to pray for the survivors and the volunteers who are serving them. Because of your generosity, we can respond, and we have these resources. Please also consider sending teams to come and help with the recovery effort. Thank you for praying, giving, and going.